In this Northern California garden, I'm reminded of the saying that the garden tells the gardener what to do. Carol Kent has followed that wisdom in her use of native plants and grasses in this dry climate. I think the land is teaching me what I can and cannot do. However, she also cleverly bends the rules in some areas that look more like England than Northern California. With her knowledge as a master gardener and with the help of her husband, Kenny, Carol has created a stunning and varied landscape that covers nearly three acres. Near the house and adjoining cottage, some areas are mostly roses. A shade garden is sheltered between two buildings. Further out from the house, a large vegetable garden and orchard provide everything from colorful lettuces to espalier heirloom apples. The hedges along the driveway are Provence lavender, just one example of Carol's creative use of drought-tolerant plants. This is the area right off the driveway in the sort of the front of the house. Yes. And so this is where the garden begins. This is, this is where the garden begins. And it used to just be bamboo and ivy and weeds. And we cleared it all out in about a month and tried. In a month. In a wow. month. And the lavender is thriving. The lavender um, in front is a variety called Munstead. Mm -hmm. And it is just a year old. And behind, we have Provence. And that's been in a little bit longer. Munstead, as you can see, is in bloom. Provence will come on and maybe two weeks, it's just about to bloom. And you've got these wonderful chrysanthemums. I'm surprised to see chrysanthemums blooming in the spring. It's I'm springtime. surprised too. <laughs> they do this every year and then I shear them back and they bloom again in the fall and we're just happy to have it twice. And olive trees. These olives we found as we were clearing everything out and we think that birds brought in the seeds and we just dug them up and moved them in and planted them along the driveway and we like the color, we like the shape and um, we haven't had any uh, olives off of them yet but we expect to. We've got a lot of bloom a lot this of year. flowers this year. Yes. And the, the combination of the lavender with the olives, is that something you would see where olive trees grow naturally? Yes, you would. Well, I just want to take this Provence lavender home with me because I can't grow it in Georgia. Well, we're just going to have to cut you a bouquet. Most of the Kent's garden is only two years old. The couple only recently retired from full-time careers as college professors. I spent about 30 years in the early childhood field and loved it very, very much. I was teaching history, political science, comparative religion, philosophy. Uh, I was the utility infielder for the social sciences department. When I retired uh, almost three years ago, um, really, really jumped into gardening. The Kents have accomplished a lot in a short time. The result of teamwork that combines two very different personalities. I am probably the motivator and the, the person who always has the big ideas. And I provide the other balance. I act as kind of an anchor, a sea anchor that holds things, not back, but keeps them within our means and our abilities and our backs and our shoulders, which are getting old and sore as we do this. This is such an intimate space in such a, the surroundings are so grand. And yet this is a really intimate garden right off your cottage. This used to be our grandson's um, sandbox and when he moved out we thought we put a little garden in here and we put these roses in and then we put in some of the hardy geraniums kind of as a ground cover and surrounded it with a little fence and came together. Most of these are David Austin roses which I love very much. One is an uh, older rose, Baron Prevost, and the rest are... Is that this one? That's this one. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's a nice a fragrance. Oh. Yeah, it does. And the arches are a lovely addition. They really. We have New Dawn. As you can see, it's very, very vigorous rose, probably too vigorous for an arch. I just can't get over it that these plants have only been here for two years because they're all robust and thriving and vigorous. We spent a lot of time amending the soil. We put in some sand, we put in a lot of compost. They don't get any feed other than a couple handfuls of alfalfa pellets in the spring, and they seem to do very well. 
What do you call this garden? Well, we call this the cottage garden, and it's really the first one we did when our daughter was living here in the cottage. We thought we'd put in a garden. I was lucky enough to live out here for a few years, and watching the transformation from just a big hill of uh, grass and a few trees to this absolute paradise, it's very, very gratifying. So this is the oldest garden that you have on the whole property. Right, it's five years old. And your style of gardening has sort of changed over time. I really enjoy the English cottage garden style and I love the roses and the fullness. But as I began to understand that I don't live in England or British Columbia, we have changed and we use more grasses, more natives, more drought tolerant plants. So I kept a couple of spaces that were much more water users, and then we went to the much more drought tolerant plants. You use stone to edge a lot of your beds. As I would dig in the garden, I would come on rock after rock, and so we just tossed them out, and once they were out, rather than haul them away, right. I thought I'll just use it to edge the uh, borders here. And I like the way you've also picked up the stone edging by using the stone wall. We dug the holes to plant these Bradford pears, and as soon as we dug the holes, they filled up with water. So we built a stone planter and uh, filled it with topsoil, and it worked. Right beside the cottage garden in a lavender-enclosed courtyard, Carol's raised beds are perfect for roses. Color combinations, are, is that anything you think about? Because purple and yellow, the Graham Stewart Thomas rose, which is so vigorous, and the Nurembergia. Well, I really like yellow and blue, and the, the purple of the Nuremberga is close enough. Graham Stewart Thomas is a strong rose, and I thought, you know, with a little support, it probably could climb up the side of this shed. So that's what we did. It's two roses. I think these are about three years old. This Nuremberga makes a carpet, and it looks as if it'll just keep going right over the wall here. Well, I'm hoping that it will. It's a fairly young plant. I planted it from six packs last year. It's a variety called Purple Robe. It takes a lot of sun and I think regular water, not too much. We don't have much water here, so we're very, very careful with it, but it seems to be doing okay. And then to turn around and have that arched rose view of the mountains. It's that climbing iceberg, easy rose, and we just enjoy that so much. Coming up next, a plant that keeps weeds under control, requires very little water, and still looks good. And later on, a friendship from down under makes a lasting impression in the Kent's garden. Stay with us. Three different... I'm always interested in how gardeners can use plants from all over the world. Carol and Kenny Kent have added a touch of Tuscany just outside the fence of their cottage garden. We're standing in this magnificent setting. Just the surrounding hillsides are so beautiful, and I've never, never been in a garden where they actually grow their own olive trees. These are Italian olives that were picked specifically for the oil uh, bearing uh, varieties that they were, but they, they are ad beautifully adapted to this Mediterranean climate. They take very little care, and we've enjoyed a couple of uh, years of olive oil off them, even though they're tiny trees. And we've been lucky to have some friends that uh, go in with us in an olive oil cooperative, so we've made very good olive oil. Lucky you. Lucky and yes. these little flowers will produce fruits that will yes. be the fruits you use. How long will it be just in one season? Yes, um, the fruits will begin to develop towards the end of uh, the summer, and you pick usually in late November, early December, and you pick some green, some black, depending upon the flavors that you want in your olive oil. We're surrounded by the, this wonderful little origeron perennial and jasmine on our right side and the flowering tobacco. So you've, you've integrated these crops with these ornamentals. Well, one of the things that we were really trying to do was keep the weeds down. And the origeron is a Mediterranean type flower. It's a native. It's a little and Very, very low and um, is no maintenance. It basically gets no water. I gave it a little water to get it started, but it just does, you know, handles it on its own. We also put in the star jasmine for a weed barrier. And the Nicotiana was supposed to be very small and ended up very big and has self-seeded for about two, three years. And we just enjoy it and let it run. The plants all respond to that California weather and you must have a secret for your soil because everything is thriving. Well, the secret for us has been to pay a great deal of attention to the soil. 
Kenny, this is what I call black gold. This is our first run compost where we, we oh. bring in dairy manure, grass cuttings from our lawn, and then, as you can see, we put our vegetable waste in it too. Look at that Look happy at the little worm. Yeah. And it has that clean smell of fresh earth. Mm hmm. Which is part of the joy of making it. And how long does it take you to, to get the compost to break down and use it in the garden? It breaks down fairly rapidly, but we keep it for about a year and then we spread it out over the beds. Well, this very is what successful. gardeners, their mouths water over this That's kind right. of compost. That's right. The Kents use compost to enrich the soil, but Carol has come up with another way to make her plants happy. We're learning about compost tea, which is a way of taking the goodness of compost and kind of multiplying it. You can simply put the highest quality compost in a bucket of water, leave it there for a couple of days, agitate it to get a little bit of uh, air into it, and then pour that mixture on your plants. It's not highly nutritious, but it has lots of microorganisms, which are very, very good for the plant. And I use it as a soil drench, and I'll just spray it or pour it around a plant. Where I have really seen the dramatic results is with potted plants who have such limited soil that they'll use up nutrients and a couple of feeds with compost tea and you really see a difference. Wow, a, a living fence, Carol, of rose blooms. This, this rose, it's a wall of flowers. Well, we put a deer fence up to protect the vegetable garden and we thought we'd make it beautiful and earn its keep. And this is Francis Lester. Francis Lester is a single rose, not uh, many petals, but beautiful. Oh, beautiful. The bees love it, and it's very, very um, vigorous. As you can see, it's only two years old, planted bare root. Clean foliage, ago. too. Clean foliage, and a very easy keeper. Was it naturally a climber? It's naturally a climber, and what I did was I just tied it on at a few key, key places, because otherwise it would flop. Here's a. Um, cane for next year. We'll either tie it in or cut it off because otherwise it would just be all over. We have an unusual year this year too because it was very warm. The roses are blooming early and the tail end of the iris, they often will bloom together but not for quite as long as we've had this year. So you, it's one of those wonderful surprises. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great surprise. The eucalyptus is California's state tree, but it originally comes from Australia. Another Australian import pops up everywhere in Carol and Kenny's garden. Stay with us. HGTV kicks off summer with a splash. Memorial Day at 5. Enjoy the taste of summer with sizzling outdoor kitchens. Come on. I had a great time exploring Carol Kent's garden in California's Napa Valley. And I could see that Carol had fun creating it. As we walked in the shade of some great mature trees, I almost tripped over one of Carol's favorite garden creatures. Carol, what are these? <laughs> these are wombats. <laughs> what they, is a wombat? A wombat is a furry marsupial uh, from primarily East Australia. So They're, what's it doing in California? Well, it migrated over here, it emigrated. <laughs> The wombat theme pops up everywhere in this garden, and it all began when Carol and Kenny went to Australia as visiting professors. On a tour of a wild animal park, the tour guide introduced Carol to her first wombat. She just scooped it up and handed it to me as if I could spend the rest of the day with this creature, which is just about what I did. And it was, it was almost like love at first hug or something. So wombats became a, a, a real love. Is this a baby one? Over That's here? a baby one. They actually become very, very large. We call them furry boulders. They move around. They have very short legs. Um, they're shy in the wild, but they're extremely gentle and patient, and um, can and can be easily uh, sort of tamed. And they're very <laughs> affectionate. So, do you? Ha you've got a, a, a whole family: cousins and grandmothers. Cousins? Aunts, uncles, they've all emigrated. So um, what, what do you call your garden? Does it have a name? Well, we call this whole place Wombat's Farm. Wombat's Farm. And they are just a, a symbol of the sort of warmth and gentleness that we would like to experience and have our friends experience on this wonderful place. So you have a sense of humor about gardening. It's not all about <laughs> pulling weeds and 
getting your favorite perennial to grow. It's about having wombats and pe yes, having, having yes. fun in the garden. Yes, and we're working very hard to train them so that we will no longer ever have to mow the lawn. They're just <laughs> nibbling it down, and it's it's beginning to work very, very well. And they're happy here in the Napa Valley. I, I think can so. See that. I think so. This lace bark elm is such a wonderful tree. Did you plant these, or were these no. also here? These were here. We were very lucky when we got the place that there were some foundation trees planted, the redwoods and a few liquid amber, some of the uh, eucalyptus. It's just a great pleasure to have these mature oh. trees. And how great to have a swimming pool that goes right into the landscape. That was here, too. And on hot days, we're very grateful to take a dip in the pool and enjoy that. This is an ambitious vegetable garden. This and, is. This and is. are you the main vegetable gardener? Not really. I think we do this mostly together. But what we have are eight beds so that we can rotate. The best of the farmers say that the best rotation is eight years. Mm -hmm. So we try and do that. These onions are some of the largest I've ever seen. Aren't they beauty? So these are our pride and joy. These are Walla Walla sweets. Walla Walla sweets. And uh, we love them. Our neighbors love them. They don't keep very well, so we have to eat them almost immediately. Go ahead and pick that one. Now, how you just go ahead just and pull, pull it out? Yep. I don't want to. I don't okay. think you'll destroy anything. Ah, look at the roots on them. Yes, wow. you can see how happy it was eating wow. up all that delicious soil. Look at that. Yeah. And that get, is a Walla Walla. They get even bigger. They'll be up that big, such that you could drape it over your arm and think you had a handbag. <laughs> that would be a unique handbag, a Walla <laughs> yeah. Walla handbag. Right. But that, that's, this is ready to eat. This it doesn't is ready have to, to be any larger than this. Well, no, it doesn't have to be. It Look will get that. larger Isn't than that. Isn't it beautiful? It's a beauty, yes. You don't, you don't use the word beautiful to describe <laughs> onions, but in this case, a Walla Walla. And that sweet, pungent smell, is that indicative of the taste? That's pretty close to what the taste is like. Yes, mm. indeed. It's just, it's a mm. delightful onion that you can use in many ways, that's the, including just eating it plain. Do you do that often? Uh, not too often, <laughs> but once in a while. How do you get more garden with less water and less work? Carol has the answer when we continue. It I love the creative ways that Carol and Kenny Kent have adapted their garden to the natural environment of their California home in the Napa Valley. When we are working on the farm, we are thinking more and more and more about how that plant can be healthy. It's more than just growing things, it's working on the very, the very heart of the planet. By using plants that thrive in this arid climate, Carol and Kenny's garden achieves a balance with nature. I think that more and more people are finding that taking cues from the native landscape is a good way to go with gardening, especially in a tough site. It is. It is. And it's something that it was very hard for me to learn. When we moved out to the farm, I really had to recognize that we're in a, a really a drought area, California often is, and begin to try and say, what grows here comfortably? Grasses. Wild poppies, the California poppy, just, is this self-sowed? Beautiful color. But my thoughts about what a garden should look like have changed, and now I really enjoy this. And, and this is just self-sowed, and these, will, these seed pods will all scatter they if will. you let them? They'll pop, and then next year we'll have some more. Sometimes I'll edit them out, and sometimes I'll just leave them where they are. And uh, it, a plant that is spreading will tell you it's happy in, in those particular circumstances. Several of the gardens in the entry are also dry gardens, and um, more and more and more, that's, that's all we're planting. I have my little bit of... Uh, country garden here mm -hmm. and now we're back in the California Mediterranean and they do they do combine well with a combination of know-how and teamwork Carol and Kenny Kent have created a garden that incorporates a variety of styles but remains in harmony with the native landscape I would say that we have been engaged in a transformation of this property and and I think it is a remarkable thing only because of Carol she has the vision, she has the drive. I don't think you could find many human beings that could do such a job in such a time. To be connected to beautiful things and to, to help make them grow just 
just feeds my soul, and that's why I do it. It feels like um, there's no place I'd rather be. When I visit gardens, I make new friends and discover new plants. Here are some treasures from Carol and Kenny Kent's garden. Imagine being able to go out and pick your own olives right from the tree. I don't live in a dry climate, but I think I could grow this in a container because it can take more humidity than other olive trees. What a great idea to use this little flea bane as a ground cover in full sun. I can also see it tucked into a dry wall. Kenny and Carol are native Californians, and so is Francis Lester. I can see cutting just one big truss of Francis Lester to make a gorgeous bouquet. I love all kinds of lavender, but this one reminds me of English cottage gardens. I like how Kenny and Carol have used it as edging along the driveway. You're lucky if you live in a warm climate because this gorgeous purple flower will come back every year. And what a great little plant for a sunny rock garden. If you want to be inspired, visit someone else's garden. You never know what you might find. Join us again on A Gardener's Diary.